Good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to continue our study on the book of Judges, but before we begin, can we pray together? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for the light that has been shining upon our path and uh, for the light that we've been able to share with others and the, re the receptions that we're getting from various people. And we're thankful, Lord, for uh, the time that we have uh, today as we once again look at the book of Judges and try to understand its relationship to the lines. We know that there are, are things that we do not fully understand, so we ask for your Holy Spirit to instruct us. Be with each person, encourage them and strengthen them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. So, um, what, what we're planning to do today is to take the book of Judges and, and place the entire book on a line. That's what I'm planning to do. Whether we can do that, how long it's going to take us to do that, I don't know, but that's what we're going to try to do. And um, we were we were looking uh, on Thursday, we were looking at uh, just some of the dates here. Uh, we focused a little bit on, on verse 14. In verse 14, we were talking about 2014 and Parminder. Um, we didn't really match like every every verse with every year, and, and it it really was more once we got into um, uh, probably verse ten that we start to um, be able to place each of these verses represents a year in in our lines. So. <clears throat> Now, the way that we, the, the way that I'm thinking of approaching this, and I'm still trying to open up this other file, so just, so I'm a little bit distracted trying to figure out where this is. Well, it's not going to help me if I'm looking in the wrong folder. No. Um, so I'll share this screen. And I guess what I tried to save last time didn't save. So I must be looking in the wrong file. This is the one. Okay. <clears throat> so what we have is we have these various enemies, right? These various enemies that end up coming against, so this is the judge's line. So we're, we just kind of have this set up. Oh, it's the wrong, just hang on. Sharing the wrong file, there we go. Now you'll be able to see what I'm looking at. And so we know that each of these lines um, are going to uh, be these way marks. And so we have a couple of couple of, couple of issues. Um, so we know that chapter seventeen uh, is it to twenty one. Is it twenty twenty one? What? How many chapters are there? Judges yeah. seventeen to twenty one. That those chapters are going to be events that occur earlier in the lines, right? That's how we understand it. So how do we address that problem? Like, what would we do with, 
the, the final chapters, these, these stories at the end of the book of Judges. How are we going to address that problem? Because they're part of the book of Judges. But what do we do with them? Are we going to put them at the end of the Judges line? I don't see how we can. Okay, well, well there's one way we could. We could look at them as um, a repeat of history. That is, if we took our lines... We, we could say, and I'm not saying this is the right way to do it, but we could say that when we go from chapter two and we start dealing with these enemies that come in and we have these, which are messages, and then we have these judges who are raised up, which are messages, that that's going to bring us to the third angel's message arriving. And so that would bring us to the point of Millerite history. But we know that after the third message, you have a fourth and so we could take those stories as representing our history. Again, instead of representing the beginning, they just represent the whole history. They become a summary of it. That's one way we could do it. We could ignore those stories as far as the line is concerned and just say that they don't represent the line. Um, so I don't know how to do this. I mean, I'm, I mean, I have ideas, different ways in which this could be done. But until we start putting them on the line, I'm not sure what is the correct way. Now, we could just look at those as, as a represent, representation of the period of darkness that precedes the lines and that they put this at the end. So we're not really sure why the Book of Judges is structured the way it is. I mean, we know that we have the way that I looked at it on Thursday, the way that I was trying to describe this is that what we have is in chapter two. It, so I'll go back there again. So in chapter two, what we have is this message that, you know, once Joshua has died and they have not been able to remove all of the enemies, right? They haven't done everything that God has asked them to do. So God has allowed those enemies to be in there to test them. So the purpose of that is um, that, that God has allowed error to, to exist. For what reason? Why does God allow error to exist just in a general sense? Okay, so testing, and, and particularly testing in what way? Isn't there a, an Ellen White statement she says about heresy coming in? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. And, and so why does heresy come in? Would that be to test characters? It tests well, and it actually develops characters too, right? So, so when I'm talking about testing, testing here, we can think of test as like a final exam, or we can think of a test like a trial, right? So these are trials that we are brought into, where we then have to depend upon God, right? So it develops character, right? It's it's you know in a crisis, character is not developed; it's demonstrated. So these aren't necessarily um, the crises. These are things where God then allows us to learn as we go through this, this process. And that's because God's, since God's people aren't doing what he asks, he allows these different errors to arise. And this has occurred within Adventism. So if we think about it, um, and in some ways, there's a there's a cause and effect, I guess, that's just sort of natural. I mean, if people aren't obeying God, heresies are going to come in. But God allows them to come in because he's trying to correct his people. So 
so if we look at, at this part of Judges, so the way that I distinguish it is when we get to chapter two and he lays this out, that I may, uh, that through them I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord or walk therein, right? That's why these nations are left. Um, we can see that within this movement, these errors have persisted and God has allowed them for a reason. And so the first part of Judges is going to address each of these um, enemies and the judge or the message that is in response to that. God will arouse his people. If other means fail, heresies will come in among them. This is Ellen White. Um, which will sift them, separating the chaff from the wheat. Lord calls upon all who believe his word to awake out of sleep. Precious light has come. Um, appropriate for this time. It is Bible truth showing the perils that are right upon us. This light should lead us to diligent study of the scriptures and the most criti critical examination of the positions which we hold. And, and this in, indeed is where we're at at this time. One of the things we would see within Adventism is the multiplicity of errors, all kinds of different errors clamoring for our attention. And so for Seventh-day Adventists, they should be studying, trying to sort out what is truth and what is error. And, and we can think about all kinds of them. I mean, there's the character of God, there's feast keeping, there's name of God, uh, there's lunar Sabbatarianism, there's uh, anti-Trinitarianism, um, just all of these different. And, and, and the reason they exist is because there is a lack of an understanding of truth within Adventism. And these different uh, heresies that come in are trying to address the problems that exist within the church. But each one of these errors themselves leads away from the church and, and the consistent thing that I see with all of these heresies, and, and we can see this even with Parminder's heresy, is that they reject old light. So you're going to have people say, Ellen White didn't have all of the light. She said there was going to be new light, and this is new light. But why do we know it's not new light? Because new light does what? Corresponds with the old light. Yeah, it makes the old light shine brighter, right? And this was the thing about this message. For me, was well, the first video I ever watched dealing with this movement was uh, uh, a Manjit Bayant, Bayant um, video where he was uh, showing that uh, the prophecy of Josiah Lich was correct. And and to me, that was, you know, sort of important for me to even have an interest in this movement. So I'd seen that video before I went down to Oklahoma. That's the only video I'd seen. Uh, Magent isn't a very Magent isn't a very good presenter, but but I could see that he was agreeing with the spirit of prophecy, and and I'd seen so many people in Adventism take the trumpets and put them, line them up with the plagues and put them as future events and all kinds of things, even very conservative Adventists, uh, people like uh, Ty Gibson and so forth. Um, so, so the fact that he was accepting the old light that had been basically abandoned by the fourth generation uh, to me was extremely powerful. And all of these errors that have crept in they reject old light. And, and some of them, of course, are, uh, you know, pretending to accept old light. Uh, but they reject, they reject many statements in the spirit of prophecy. And um, so you can't reject, you, to say that, well, Ellen White didn't have all the light or she didn't understand it. Um, to me, that's a major problem. So if, if Ellen White says something is truth, I'm taking it just like I would the word of God. 
I'm not going to. Uh, Amen. I'm not going to uh, say, well, Ellen White didn't understand this point or it wasn't time. You know, God didn't reveal this to her. I don't believe that that's the case based on what she says about her writings. You have to either take her completely or reject her, just like you would with the Bible. Now, of course, she has to agree with the scriptures. If she disagreed with the scriptures, then we would have to say that she's a false prophet. But I haven't found this in, you know, 40 years of studying the spirit of prophecy. And, and that's, that's pretty amazing because people who write books make all kinds of mistakes. Right? It, it, it's impossible not to to get things wrong to get stories mixed up to get to bring in all kinds of error and we don't see this in the spirit of prophecy so so anyway um we know that we have all of these heresies that have come in and and so what the way that i'm going to try to understand this is that these heresies primarily have come in in Adventism, when? When do we really start to see all of these heresies coming into Adventism? So it may be hard for somebody that's younger, but uh, where would we mark this? If we're going to take two, two way marks, would we take 1989 or 9-11? How's that? We're going to where these heresies came in. Well, I would I have thinking, to... Go ahead, Stephen. Well, I was thinking just generally Adventism, you know, around 1900s. Okay, well, so when did you become an Adventist, Stephen? About 2006. Okay. So I've been an Adventist since uh, 1982, and 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 I was sort of well, I was exposed to um, you know conservative Adventism very early on, and all different kinds of ideas. But I would say since 9/11 is where we see a multiplicity of errors being commonly promulgated by various groups within Adventism. Now, part of that could be the internet. So, you know, maybe we just weren't exposed to these things, but uh, Dwight, you were going to say something too about that. Well, I would be, if, if I was given the choice between 1989 and 2001, I would have to say that, you know, some of these things started to creep in about 2001. Yeah, that's what I saw. Um, I saw that they became really prominent. Uh, we didn't prior to nine eleven. You you might have you might have heard the odd person teaching some things, but you know if you think about lunar Sabbatarianism, uh, name of God, you know Adventists just would not be caught up in the name of God uh, prior to nine eleven. This is something post 9 11. Um, now, I know there was a character of God stuff um, going on uh, for a while, but it became very prominent after um, 9 11. And that's probably the first one that I really heard of. Anti Trinitarianism, definitely um, after 9 11. Uh, so, you know, and again, this may be in part just because of the internet. But I also think it's because of the corruptions that existed within the church um, that you definitely saw people becoming much more disaffected with the church itself. And um, people basically chasing all kinds of, uh, of ideas. So definitely the movements that I saw prior to 9-11 that were in Adventism tended to be conservative and try to follow the spirit of prophecy. They wouldn't step outside of it, at least not intentionally. Um, but there is sort of this counterfeit that was rising, if we want to put it that way. Um, 
people going back to the pioneers. Now, part of this would be, you know, the pioneers disc. There's lots of different things, uh, access to information, but um, the heresies that exist within Adventism definitely multiplied after 9-11. So that's the way that I would, would look at it. But I mean, these are, the groundwork has been laid already. And, and even prior to 1989, I mean, there was counterfeits of this movement. Um, so uh, there were preachers who were talking about Ellen White's statement about uh, Daniel chapter 11, that the history and connection with this prophecy will be repeated. And so uh, I can't think of the guy's name. Um, but I know John Osborne, people may, some people may know that name. He got caught up in sort of uh, and the other guy. Uh, no, it starts with a W, but I can't think of his last name. Um, so there, there was all kinds of things going on prior to that. But they tended to be more conservative and more trying to stick to the spirit of prophecy. I mean, there was movement saying that the church was Babylon. Um, so, so I was aware of those types of things, but definitely not the types of heresies that developed after 9-11. But is it, <clears throat> in, in keeping with what Stephen was saying, is it possible yeah. that what was coming up in Adventism prior to that could be placed as a generational situation? Okay, so, well, you have the period of darkness, so that's going to start with uh, Seventh-day Adventist as answer questions on, on doctrine, right? So we're going to have the fourth generation. We have this period of darkness. But then we have a reform line that arrives. And, and prior to 1989, there were people presenting light, like Louis F. Weir and, and some others, um, and, but it wasn't the lay people prior to 1989. Now, Jeff is raised up in 1989 and he's a lay person. Now, I mean, there were some people, you know, you could say Ty Gibson was a lay person and he's before 1989, but, but he's around that time. And, uh, and Charles, uh, it's Charles, uh. Wheeland or Wheeling or something like that. Charles Wheeling. That's it. Charles Wheeling, who was uh, just prior to 1989 uh, teaching about these repeats of history. So you got Ty Gibson raised up and, and Charles Wheeling and, um, and different people that are um, conservatives and trying to bring light, but they're going off into different errors. But then you have Jeff raised up in 1989. And, and uh, so Jeff starts laying this foundation, which is, is that we need to go back to understand Millerite history. This is unique because um, this was not happening and I haven't seen it anywhere else other than the movement that Jeff began. This this repeat of Millerite history. Um, does anybody else know of, of any place else where you you would find this idea? Because I've never seen it anywhere. Now there are some people who now have followed Jeff who are teaching things parallel to it, but most of them have gone off into. Either just that we need to accept everything the pioneers said. So they're going to, uh, and, and a lot of them will accept Uriah Smith as a pioneer. Right? So we see that in uh, Washington, in Oregon. But I think this is a unique movement in the, that the foundation that, it's, that is laid is very, very solid. So... If we're going to look at these, this judge's line, um, we could look at, um, I mean, we could take this whole line. So the question that we have to ask here, so I've been asking lots of questions. We're kind of a bit scattered. But could we take this judge's line 
and started at 1989? Or would we take this judge's line and start it at 9-11? So, so that's kind of the question there. That is, if we're looking at the judge's line, are we looking at it as a reform line that has actually a zoom in onto the 9-11 way mark? Or are we just taking it as a line that covers our history? Right, because we have said that judges is from 9-11 to 2023. And, and if we do that, wouldn't it make the most sense to take this as a line that's zooming into 9-11 as a way mark? And so we would start it at 9-11. Does that make the most sense to people? I'm really not sure unless we have two lines because you were mentioning Jeff was the one that brought in the best ideas. Right. And that was but, 89. Right. So, right. So we know that that we have this foundation that's laid. So uh, we, and we have a reform line addressing Jeff himself, right? He has his own personal reform line. But remember, we can look at a way mark in a line and we can zoom into that way mark. And when we zoom into that way mark, we will have another reform line. And, and if we were gonna address the period of darkness, in the judge's line, because these are the enemies that are left, um, we, would, we would then say that this period of darkness is some particular darkness that 9-11 itself is addressing. Now, one of the things about 9-11, so if we, if we look at Look at Samuel Snow's history. So remember, Samuel Snow is going to have this prediction before midnight line, right? That's going to be Samuel Snow's letters. And it's going to begin before April 19th. And, and it, in a sense, is a zoom in to the April 19th way mark. Now, we haven't really addressed completely how Samuel Snow's line is a reform line. We've, we've never really done that um, in the way that we're trying to do this here with the judges line. But, but Samuel Snow has his own reform line, right? So his letters are a reform line. Right. Okay. And, and so we can see that this movement parallels Samuel Snow's letters. Now, back in 2018, Jeff and I were discussing this at the camp meeting at Pigeon Lake in Alberta um, because he was now presenting Samuel Snow's letters. Jeff was. Uh, I was presenting the Week of Christ study. And, and Jeff had finally understood Samuel Snow's letters and saw the importance of them. And so that's what he was presenting. And but we had this discussion regarding how we dealt with Samuel Snow's letters in that his letters, because we had 9-11 as being April 19th, but yet Samuel Snow's letters start before 9-11. And we didn't really have a solution to the problem at the time. But Jeff, Jeff said, well, you know, um, you know, we have to take Samuel Snow's line as beginning before 9-11. But remember, we had these two way marks, 9-11 being both August 11th, 1840 and April 19th, 1844. And so as we came to understand the lines better, we could see clearly that Samuel Snow's um, letters come after the way mark of August 11th, 1844. So in, in that case, uh, April, April 19th is actually serving a different purpose in Samuel Snow's letters. That is, the way that uh, Chawatu was addressing this back in uh, 2017 is he was trying to 
um, he was trying to create this new waymark we call sunset. And, and I agree with him. That is, I think Chawatu was correct in that, but he didn't understand that we were looking at different lines. That was the real problem. We didn't know what line we were in. And so if we look at the line of, of Samuel Snow, he has August 11th, 1840, but he is marking April 19th, 1844 as sunset, correct? Even though he doesn't call it that, he is. Because right. if, if July 21st is midnight, then that means April 19th is sunset. Because he's halfway through, he's at midnight. Midnight, you have sunset, and then you're going to have sunrise, which is going to be October 22, 1844. So, um, I'm, I'm going to do this on the whiteboard. I know I've done this other times, but when we start to look at this in connection with the judges, then uh, this might help quite a bit. Just gotta erase this stuff. Because <clears throat> this was a real struggle I was having in 2017, trying to understand how Samuel Snow's letters fit into the lines. And I didn't have enough information back then to really comprehend what was going on. But when we look at these lines, we know we have August 11th. 1840, and we're going to have April 19th, 1844, and over here we're going to have, we'll just put them here, October 22, and we're going to have midnight, so this is going to be July 21st, but Samuel Snow's letters had this July 18th date, 1844, and the three days, so this becomes a symbol of the prediction before midnight. And what we were struggling with is that um, we're going to have his first letter here, February 16th, 1844. And Tavo was trying, he knew about this letter that is, and it's going to be published six days later on February 22. So Tavo was trying to understand um, this increase of light, this development of the prediction before midnight. And what, what Tavo noticed was this May 2nd letter. So this is going to be Passover. Now, Tavo doesn't understand that. He just knows there's a May 2nd letter. And this is the second letter. He knows the first letter and the second letter. Now, this first letter is also going to be published on April 3rd. So April 3rd is Passover, as kept by the Jews. May 2nd is the true Passover. And, of course, the center of this is uh, April 19th, the first day of the first month. So this is um, an important uh, understanding of what what happens here so Tabo tried to say this is the prediction before midnight so this is in 2017 this is the work actually of blessings and um the Tabo's presenting it as his own understanding and so you know he's going to have this as this pbm right prediction before midnight now we start digging into samuel snow's letters and find that this first letter the second letter well, there's actually two more letters. There's going to be uh, uh, the June 22 letter, which is Pentecost. 
And then there's going to be the last letter that's published three days before midnight, right? Now there's writing dates and stuff in here and other things, but these, these four letters end up creating this reform line. Now, if we looked at this reform line, so we're going to have one, two, three. Now this here is, you know, this letter is going to be this formalization. So this, we could say this is the arrival of the first message, the formalization of the first message. This is going to be the empowerment when it's put in the signs of the times. And then, um, however we want to do the rest of this, it's kind of uncertain. We could say May 2nd is the fourth because there is no writing of this letter. And then you're going to have this letter here that's doubled, right? Because remember, this letter here is written on Pentecost, and it's going to be published um, five days later. Now, Pentecost is the third day of the sixth month, so five days later is the or third day, sixth day of the third month, and so it's going to be on the eleventh day of the third month that it's published. And if you double this you get the 22nd day of the sixth month, which is the date it's published, right? Is that making sense to people? So this symbolizes five and six, midnight and the midnight cry, right? And then July 18th would be the seventh. Can we see that, that we can take those seven way marks and put them on this line? And so we have a line of Samuel Snow's letters. Looks logical. Okay. Now, Samuel Snow's letters, even though they're a prediction before midnight, um, they are a zoom into a line in Millerite history. And that is, you know, this is going to be the first day of the first month. And, and my understanding of this is that this line is a zoom into April 19th. Now, of course, one of the things that I noticed was that from February 16th, which is second month, 16th day, that there's going to be from this date to this date, two months and 16 days. And so, whoops, pardon me, I'm putting this wrong, because this is going to be the center here. So we'll just do it this way. This is going to be the center. So this is going to be two months and 16 days. So May 2nd, which Cabell picked as the prediction before midnight, uh, becomes the center of a chiasm. Now, later on, we're going to find that uh, this period here, this 126 days, April 19th is going to be the center. This is going to be 63 and 63. And his letters line up exactly with the events that happened in 2018, that 126 days. And um, so we have this. And that's why Jeff really understood uh, the connection between uh, this history and later on when we apply it to July 18th. And this becomes uh, one year and 25 days. This ends up being 391 if you put it as a symbol so that you're going to get that 391 days. This lines up with October 13th and this lines up with November 9th. But anyway, I'll leave that up for now. So the main point here is that Samuel Snow's letters begin after August 11th, 1840. And, you know, they end prior to midnight. So, so this history here is, represents something in our history that is a zoom into a way mark. And this way mark is, um, now, so what we're going to say here is that in this way mark, this is the way mark that they picked for sunset, that is Chowatu, right? He's going to take the May 2nd. So let me see if I can do this another way. So, so we're going to look at this in our history. So in our history, we have 9-11, but we also have this 9-11. Even though they're the same event, they're on two different lines, so to speak, right? They're, they serve two different purposes. 
So this is going to be the August 11th, 1840. This is going to be 2001. And so when we say that Samuel Snow's letters span this history, we, we would have to say that we're looking at a different line when we're addressing the letters. Right? Does that make sense to people? Again, it's logical. Okay. So some people have a hard time separating the same event, but it's just because it's serving a different purpose in a different line. Because originally, remember, Jeff had this as being August 11th, 1840, 1989. Uh, but then after 9-11... He chose this as being August 11th, 1840. But then later he took these two, 9-11 as being April 19th, and he combined them. But he brought them together in one point where really we need to separate them. So in this prediction before midnight, here I'm going to change this to the prediction before midnight. Um, we, we have this problem of of sunset. So what they originally done, did is they put sunset over here, or Chowatu did, right? And this is going to be May 2nd. So this is going to be April 19th. But he was having problems uh, because he was, and he, they were using Psalm 23 as their model. But he was trying to say, well, this, this isn't really, 9-11 is not really April 19th. He was saying sunset is is April 19th, which didn't really make much sense to me because he was also putting May 2nd here. Well, May 2nd isn't sunset. But because he was confusing the lines, he didn't really know what to do. Um, so in a sense, what he was doing is he was he was um, moving 9-11 over to here. So he would say, this is April 19th. And this 9-11 symbol is really something that happens on May 2nd. Um, but it, it just became, I knew there was something wrong with it. And that's just because he didn't understand the line. So, uh, but if we did it this way and we said, uh, this is 9-11, but this 9-11 is August 11th, 1840 then we could have this other way mark and, and May 2nd becomes 2017, by the way. Um, so then we would, we would just say that this serves a different purpose. So what we have is we're zooming into this. So this May 2nd, that's the center of a chiasm. In a sense, you can bring these two together, right? You can take this May 2nd and this April 19th and bring them together, just like you can bring these two together. That is, May 2nd is the center of a chiasm. So I shouldn't really put May 2nd over here. I'm going to put it here. And this is July 18, 2020. Does that make sense? So that means we're between July 18, 2020 and midnight. But this whole line then, this line here in Samuel Snow is this is zoom in to 9-11. Now, it's going to bring us to, because we're still in this July 18 history, because we're not to midnight yet. So we're in this period of three days. Am I confusing people? Am I making it clear? Or is it, uh, as I, am I muddying the waters here a bit? I think it looks good. Okay. So if, if we're going to take um, the judges, we're going to say that it's a zoom in to this way, Mark, being 9-11 is April 19th. But it includes all of this. That is, we're still in Samuel Snow's letters, but we're between... You know, this July 18th, because this was Samuel Snow's letters, July 18th. That was our July 18, 2020. His was 1844. 
but we haven't proclaimed the message at midnight yet. Right? So we're not to July 21st. We've been in this movement for a long time, and we would have to decide exactly where that is, but we have been, and I would say since 9-11, but is it since this 9-11, but it's also the history that precedes it. That is, this 9-11, there are things that are happening with this line. Once, once we understand that 9-11 represents April 19th, because remember, when we first have 9-11, 9-11 is just August 11th, 1840, right? So, but our movement comes to understand this. And so when does the movement come to understand this? Do we know when we came to understand that 9-11 was April 19th, the first day of the first month? Isn't that going to be in 2014? I would think so. Okay. But I don't remember. Now, uh, and, and, and I said something wrong. I said this was 2017. This actually, Chawatu has 2014. I had it as 2017. So he put May 2nd as 2014. He marked 2014 as sunset. And so what we would have to say is that this line if we wanted to look at it another way, is this is 2014 to, you know, our history. That that is when the prediction before midnight begins. Now, connected with that is Parminder made this false prediction about 2014, that it was the Sunday law. But really, when 2014 came about, um, we have this first separation in the movement, right? In a major way, like individuals had left before. But in 2014, you have all these ministries leaving the movement. And so, so we can see that 2014 um, has to somehow fit into this. Now we're, we're saying it's the center of it. So I know just to get, confusing here so 2014 becomes the center of this prediction before midnight so we have to figure out the start of this and the start of this would have to be 9 11 but it it can't be this 9 11 it has to be this 9 11 so this 9 11 is the first day of the first month but this 9-11 is August 11th, 1840, right? So that's going to be the, you know, 26th day of the fourth month. Okay. So somewhere between here and here in Samuel Snow's letters, he's going to have this prediction before midnight. And so we're going to have to say that, you understand what I'm saying? Uh, uh, that it still exists before, but when is it going to become prominent? So that means there's some message that's going on here. And, and what is that? What is this prediction before midnight? What's, what's going to start this? That's what I don't know yet. Okay. So there are still pieces of the puzzle that I don't have. Okay, so new light is unfolding of old light. That was written by Ron there earlier. Well, that's right. Did you just write that now, Ron?
Okay, so I think he did. Okay. Um, so hopefully you can see the struggle that we're going through here. So we're going to say this judge's line starts somewhere, that there's a period of darkness, and, and we have to decide where that is. Now, let's look at it this way. Um, okay, so we're going to have all these different judges. So we're going to have Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. So let's let's go here. Let's let's struggle through this because this is this is. Um, so the first enemies are going to be um, who that Othniel is going to address. This is Babylon, isn't it? King of Mesopotamia. I think we addressed that. Okay. So, so if we're going to look at this first enemy and the first judge, how did we how did we address that? Who was this this enemy? What message was it, and how did Othniel address it? Do we remember that long ago? Does anyone remember? I was trying to use the name as a memory tool to remember. Okay. Sometimes that works. Okay. Has it worked? <laughs> I mean, we try to think back to what what was being addressed at 9-11. Because remember, this is a call out of Babylon, in a sense, right? That I mean, Babylon right. oppressing them. Okay, Iran remembers Othniel, the son of Kenaz, uh, equals 209. Is that um, the whole phrase or just his name? So the 20th day of the ninth month. That's the phrase. Okay, okay, that's, that's what I thought. Okay, so the 20th day of the ninth month. Now, so why does Othniel represent the 20th day of the ninth month? Isn't that when they were supposed to separate from their strange wives? Okay, right. So we know that these are going to be these strange wives, right? But then, correct, yeah. we also have Cush and Rishtham. And the translation there would be double wickedness. Okay. Double wickedness. Right. So we had this double wickedness. Okay. What else? Well, the fact that they, at this point, had turned and were serving Balaam and the groves, which again is a double wickedness. Okay. <laughs> because... We, we find that the priests of Baal and the priests of the groves come up again with Elijah. Okay. So 
it's the service then to the double wickedness from the from the effect of the double wickedness for eight years. So so we also have a dual when it when it's saying this uh, as king of Mesopotamia, Is it Mesopotamia or Aram of the two rivers? Um, okay, so well, let me see here. I mean, Aram is the name for Syria. So, um, but... Uh, Because Kushan, as we're seeing, in, in the hand of Kushan, Rish, Tham, where Kushan is a region of Arabia. Mm -hmm. But Risha is, as, as this would be translated, would be the would be a feminine of another word, which is wrong, fault, or wickedness. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing with a double wickedness here that has something to do with a feminine word. Okay. Okay, so Mesopotamia, this is just the normal way you would say Mesopotamia in Hebrew. Okay. Mesopotamia is Greek, right? So... Um, but in Hebrew, they just use Aram, which means the highlands between the two rivers. Okay. Right, which is Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia in Greek just means between the two rivers. But Pontamac, you know, like the Pontamac River, which is uh, a doubling because it's like the river river. You mean the Potomac? However you say it, Potomac? Potomac in Washington, D.C., yeah. Okay. That's how they say it, eh? Yeah, that's what it is. Right, Potomac. Okay. Uh, okay, so anyway, that means river in Greek. So, so that's why you get Mesopotamia. Okay, so, so anyway, this is from Mesopotamia. So this is Babylon. And uh, so this name... Kush Rash Rishathayim. Um, so it's uh, Kushan, a region of Arabia. And uh, Risha means wrong or wickedness. But because this plural here at the, at the end is a dual plural, right, that's why it's this double wickedness. Right. Okay. Uh, same with uh, Mesopotamia, uh, Nahaarayim. That yim there is a double plural, right? It's a dual plural, not a more than two, but just two. Okay, so um, so we have we have this double wickedness that's come up. Mm -hmm. We're observing that the children of Israel had served Balaam and the groves. So we have again the priests of Baal. The priests of the grove. Yeah. And then God raises up Othniel. Right. So Othniel would be the force of God. Right. And we said that this was the Holy Spirit. Okay. Rep the message, the work of the Holy Spirit at 9 11. Right. That's how we understood it. And so this Mesopotamia has who in captivity? Is the Seventh-day Adventist Church in captivity to Babylon? Yes. Right. And that, that's the way that I understood it. Right. So this is this is a message or a wake-up call to Seventh-day Adventists. So this is 
So that's how we would take this message. So the enemy here is not actually one of the enemies that's in the land, right? It's one that's outside the land. Right. So the first one is one that's outside. But Othniel's going to be raised up to address it. So this is the Holy Spirit coming with 9-11. With, with which message? The second angel's message, right? Right. Okay. So this is the second angel's message. So 9-11 here is the 9-11 that's... Uh, so in a, situ in a situation like this, you yeah. have the second angel's message, which we have identified multiple times throughout different portions as a doubling. Right. Coming up against a double wickedness. As shown in Balaam and the priests of the groves. Right. And and, and so this is something that uh, this message that 9-11 addresses. But this is the 9-11 that is the arrival of the second angel, right? Not the nine right. that is the empowerment of the first angel, as I, as I drew on the board, right? So now we come to understand, in this movement, we start to address with this prediction before midnight um, symbol that's going to start at 9-11, but a different 9-11, right? So we have one event. It's representing two things. So on this line, it's representing the arrival of the second angel. That is April 19th. Uh, and we're going to understand this. Um, you know, So I don't know exactly how to show how this arrives in our line, but we're going to look at 9-11 as the beginning. So this first method message of Othniel is a zoom into a line, right, that is... If we go back here, so I really want people to understand what we're doing. Um, so we're taking this judge's line. This whole judge's line is a zoom into 9-11 as the second angel's message. And, and so this happens in our movement at a certain time. And I would say that the time that I mark this is 2014. But this line itself... So, so this this line here, so this whole line is a zoom into 2000. Um, like it's it's a zoom into 911. And, and so it's going to reach back. So with this way mark here, we actually have to create another reform line. So I'm just gonna do this for now. Let's put it here. Um, so we go back here, we get rid of this line, but we know that this is going to be a reform line itself. That is, when we take this story of, of this history, we can take Othniel and we can say that this is going to, we have a, a way mark here that we can zoom into, right? So we can create a reform line because is not are each of these judges their reform lines in and of themselves, right? Because that's what we've already done. We've drawn reform lines for each of these uh, judges. And remember this first one, Othniel, um, Ehud, and Shamgar, we actually put as a triple that they go together, right? Remember, we didn't do them as separate reform lines, each one of them? Right. We put them as part of a progression of a reform line. Um, but that progression of the reform line, so what we would do here, uh, I'll do it this way, is we're not going to go into the detail of each of these reform lines. We're just going to say here that this first one is Othniel, Whoops. Ehud and Shamgar. Does that make sense? Just get rid of these commas.
So that's going to be the arrival of the first angel's message. That's all going to be related to in this line of the judges. This is going to be how we lay it out. Okay, so yes. So with the arrival of the Holy Spirit, the question is in the chat, would you say an increase of knowledge as it pertains to the truth versus the errors that have come into SDA and continues to increase and who is trying to bring us back to the old foundation given that three angels' messages are incremental? Okay, so I understand some of that. But, but definitely it's the arrival of the Holy Spirit. It's an increase of knowledge, right? An increase of light. And it addresses, of course, the darkness. The darkness there has to be Seventh-day Adventism, right? What has come into Adventism. That is, Adventism is in captivity uh, to Babylon in that context, in this line. So we have Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. And that's going to be the first of these. So we're going to be able to take this judges line and lay out the different judges on this line. So, so what are the names of the judges that we're going to have? So let's, let's just do it this way. So if we're going to go through the judges, we're going to have after Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, we're going to have who? Who are the judges? We should remember them. I can tell you them, but who are the judges next? Samuel's, Samuel's one of them, mate. No, but the oh, next no, no. Thing, after after Shamgar, you're going to have Deborah and Barak, right? Right. How do you spell Barak? B R A K B A R A K. Okay, so now you could, O B A M A Obama. Yeah. Okay. Wow. I, I apologize. I was thinking you was talking. I was thinking Kings instead of. And then we're going to have Gibeon, or uh, or what? What's the Gibeon there? Just a minute. We got Gideon. Gideon. Yeah, Gideon after Deborah and Barak. Yeah, so then you're going to have Gideon, right? And then you have Tula. Okay, so so we're just going to do it this way, and we'll change whatever we need to change. Uh, now you have Tula, Tola, and Jair. I did Jair like that. Okay. And then who do we have? Jephthah. Did... Oh, Jephthah. Okay. And then next, Samson. Ibsen. Ibsen. Okay, you're right. Okay, I didn't put Gideon in there uh, for some reason. Um, okay, who do we have? Ibsen after Jephthah. How do you spell that? I B Z A N. Okay, and and I forgot to put Gideon in here. Okay, so we got Gideon, and then who else? Elon. Okay, so we got Elon. Oops. And then who else? Abdon. Okay. Abdon. Okay, who else? Samson. Samson. Okay, so when we look at this, how many do we end up having? Nine, 10, 11, 12. Okay, yeah, so it depends how we want to group these together, right? 
Um, now we're going to have uh, Tolly and GR, then Jephthah, then Gideon, then Jephthah. I can't remember how we do this. I'm getting confused now, all these names. <clears throat> Okay, so some way we're going to have to understand how these line up with these different messages, right? These different waymarks, because we have seven waymarks. I mean, I say that all of these, Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, are the first. And Deborah and Barak are going to be lined up here. And then we have who next? Tola and JR? Gideon and I. Gideon's next. After um, Deborah and Barak. Okay, so Gideon's next. Right. And then um, and Jeff is going to be um, so Tola and JR. So now I'm getting confused. Okay, so you have Deborah and Barak and you have Gideon. And then you're going to have, um, after Gideon, you have, now there's um, Abimelech's conspiracy. So what happens with Abimelech's conspiracy? How do we understand that? What do you do with Are we going to put, uh, um, how do we address the enemy and the deliverer from Abimelech? Anybody remember how we address Abimelech? Well, he sought to be the, the first king of Israel. Okay. He's kind of the anti-judge. Yeah. You're talking about Abimelech. Well, we're talking about Abimelech, but how do we address Abimelech? How do we address the judge in that period? Who's the judge? Well, we had the uh, 69 weeks. Okay, so we have the 69 weeks. Yeah. So we have Jotham, the youngest son. So what does he represent? Yes, but he wasn't really a judge. No, I know he's not a judge, but that's why I'm asking what, how we address this. But even if he's trying to be a king, wouldn't he still be the judge? No, no, he's not a judge. I've been the not a judge. No. He's not delivering he... any oppressor. It's just an internal problem. I think we related him to the week of Christ. Yeah, I know. So we relate him to the week of Christ. So uh, the question is, how do we address him in this judge's line? Because I don't want to leave 
be him out. Okay, so uh, Abimelech wasn't uh, Jerubabel, which wasn't that uh, Gideon? Yeah, so this is, so yeah, so you got uh, Gideon. So Jer sons. Jerubabel, so that was Gideon, uh, was during the time of Abimelech, right? Or after, the, after Abimelech, I'm sorry, Gideon was before Abimelech because Abimelech, <laughs> was one of his, was his illegitimate son, right? Yeah. Okay. So if we're going to take Jotham, he's not a judge, but what is he? He's, he's the one who presents the midst of the week. So wouldn't we line jo Jotham up with Samuel Snow? I think we did, didn't we, before? Yeah, we did. But, right? So so we did. But if we're going to look at this history and we're comparing it to... Um, so if Gideon is the empowerment of the first angel, uh, can we see that we could put Jotham here as this prediction before midnight? You could. Okay. Because that's who I think that we understood that Jotham represented Samuel Snow, his message, his letters. And, and Samuel Snow had presentations on the midst of the week, right? That was actually his, his whole thing, even though that's we were right. all about October 22, 1844. It was based upon an understanding for the first time in the Millerite movement that Jesus wasn't crucified in 33 AD at the end of the 70s, but he was crucified in the midst of the week, which would place it in 31 AD is where uh, Snow placed it. And um, so that midst of the week, we, we could see that this was about the 70 weeks. And we can also see really particularly with our movement, if we compare it with our movement, the midst of the week is one of the most central uh, understandings that comes to this movement. Right. So the week of Christ and understanding these structures, the chiasm, is a fundamental part of what happens to this movement. Right. In connection with the prediction before midnight, because we just saw that with Samuel Snow's letters itself these chiasms, and understanding 457 BC. So it becomes very, uh, there becomes all these threads that come together in understanding this. So, so Jotham himself, we're not going to put as one of the judges, but he does parallel Samuel Snow. Now, Samson, um, we're going to place after that is, Samson is a repeat of history. But Jotham, well, Jotham wouldn't be forward. It would be um, to Lo and uh, J.R. when they come forth. Yeah. So that's after, that's yeah, after Gideon. Yeah. Okay, so that's what we have to decide. So Tola and J.R. we could put here, right? Yeah. Okay. But I'm just saying Jotham is is not one of the judges. Okay. okay. Now, so Tola and Jair come after um, Gideon, right? Is that what we're saying? Well, you can have Abimelech's conspiracy. Uh, let me see. Where is the here? Um, yeah, that's Gideon. So, you know. The next one would be um, Tola and Jair, 
after Abimelech's conspiracy. Yeah, Jacob would be on number five, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, we're not we're not going to move ahead that quickly. So, okay. So, are we going to put them as the arrival of the second angel's message, and what would be the basis of doing that? Now, remember, Tola and Jair, we we put them together, and why do we do that? Not just because they're just in five verses, but what was the reasons? Judges 10, verse 1. Well, they judged for 23 years. Okay, one judges for 23, and the other mm -hmm. one for 22. So 45. Okay, 45. Okay. And and why would that be the second angel's message? Forty five in Millerite history. Well, you have forty five years from seventeen ninety eight to the arrival of the second angel, the okay. spring of eighteen forty four. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, so we need to put Tola and Jair there. I mean, there's a lot of details that we addressed before, but. Um, but we're going to place them there. Now, then we have Jephthah. And so we need to be careful here in how we're doing this. We're not just going to arbitrarily place these. We, we need to figure out what, because now what we're going to have is we have um, three more spots left and four more judges. So what would we do with these? So, and this is just tentative, right? We don't have to. Well, wouldn't they be midnight, the midnight cry, and the close of probation? Okay, but we have four. And we have three spots. So so what's going to happen next after Jair dies? Do you have four or do you have five? Well, Samson, Samson is um, outside of this line. Okay. Because I'm taking this judge's line in parallel with Millerite history, and you're going to have the three angels' messages and then the fourth. So I'm saying that Samson is going to cover this whole history. Um, so I don't put him as, as one of these waymarks. So you're going to have Jephthah's, Jephthah's conflict with Ephraim. So now we're going to see we have a conflict with Ephraim, right? And then we're going to have Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon. So they're going to all be placed together. So, I mean, maybe we could do it this way, but okay. So we'll put Jephthah here. So that's going to be at the formalization of the message. Now, would we take these and put them all together and maybe put Samson as the seventh? Or is there some other way to deal with this? Because Samson would be the Sunday law um, as far as, or the close of probation. How should we do this? How do we address these three judges? How did we do Ebzan, Elon, and Abdon? Because they're going to relate to what symbols? Well, you got 10 years for um, Elon. Okay. Okay, so we had actually all the symbols of July 18, 2020, didn't we? Seven years, 10 years, and eight years. So could we take these all and put them together? as representing 
the midnight cry. I think that I think the we got the numbers where you just you just used them. It was seven, what ten, and um, what was the other one? Eight. Eight. So there, there's one eight seven. Well, there's a zero one zero eight seven. So there's that's that's one eight seven. Um, I kind of recall us doing that. Okay. Yeah, well, there are years of judging. It uh, yeah. comes to 25. Okay. And there was 25 days from midnight to, to the midnight. midnight cry. Yeah. But we also mm. divide them in this way that we can take um, 718, right? July 18. By the seven, ten, and eight. Right, so we get July eighteen, and and then the twenty-five that they add up to is the twenty days from midnight to the midnight cry. Okay, so we'll do it that way. And then we have Samson is the seventh. Right, so in Jeff's line, this would be, you know, nine eleven, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law. But in this, in Samson we see a, well, a particular case. I mean, he's he's covering this whole history, of course. And each of these are a line, so we could take the line of each of these and lay them over top of these lines. But Jotham is, is Samuel Snow. So does this look relatively good? I, I, I think it fit better than I thought it would. And it's nine o'clock, so uh, that's where we're gonna stop. So you can think about that then. But I think it's pretty persuasive that we could do this with these judges. People agree? Uh, yes, it seems logical, and the flow is right the way we way we thought these things through. Mm -hmm. Now, each one of these, of course, has symbols that you know we can lay them over this line, right? But we're going to say that this is from 9 11 to 2023. Right. And so each one of these judges then is focusing upon a different point in our history. And, and we've already done that. But so we, we have the lines for each of these, and we could see how each of these become a zoom into these various waymarks. So in our line, 9, 9 11 represents the time of the end. Okay. So darkness after darkness follows on um, time of the end, right? Yes. But okay. but remember that this is the time of the end. Every every reform line has a time of the end. Okay. It's it's it's, it's all progressive, right? Until the actual so this is time of the end. Yeah, so this isn't yeah. nineteen eighty nine, this is nine eleven. Right. So the time of eleven for this line of the judges is something internal within this movement. Right. Now, and I'm saying, you know, that this this represents 9-11 to 2023. But each of these lines represents a point in our history where we address a particular error. And some of them are external enemies and some then they turn to internal enemies. Right. 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 Okay. And, and and then Samson, of course, is dealing with the Philistines. So it's an external enemy again. And and there's external enemies in here too. But okay, so we'll pick this up tomorrow and let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you again for the study and how you have helped us uh, to look at these lines. We pray that you can correct any errors we may have, give us wisdom and understanding as we continue to study these things. Be with each person. May your angels watch over us and be with us in the study this afternoon as well as we look at the lines more simply. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.